I asked uh, Lisa to come and out from Florida and share with us this weekend um, and tonight to tell those parts of her story that the Holy Spirit is going to lead her to share that will be an encouragement uh, to you, okay? So, Lisa, would you come on up? And, um, okay, let's give her a hand. She's come all this way, and, and we're looking forward to what you have to say, okay? Thank all right. You. I'm going to grab a stool to put this on in case I need it. And I need my timer, so, okay. Well, hold on, I'm getting this. I probably won't need it once I get going, but I might get excited and forget. Okay. It is such, 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 such a pleasure to be with you. Um, I just am feasting on the stories. It's like I couldn't get enough. I wish I could sit with every one of you and hear, hear your journey and hear how Jesus reached out and just ran after you. Like, it just undoes me. So I'm so thankful, and I just honor all of you. And I'm so blessed already to be here with you. It was 1990 when I initiated an appointment, a lunch date with my parents at the Kyoto restaurant. I have a disclaimer. My book released nine days ago, and it's creating some waves in the family. So. I'm a little emotional right now. So, I'm emotional about my story always, but right now it's a little heightened, so just bear with me. <laughs> so, 1990, and I initiated a lunch date with my parents at the Kyoto restaurant in Salt Lake City. And we sat down at the table, and I, I don't think I'd ever been so nervous in my entire life. And I tried to eat something and tried to make conversation. And then some point in the conversation, I said, Mom and Dad, I just need to share with you something that's really meaningful and a bit life-changing. I have placed my trust in Jesus Christ alone for eternal life. And that's where my story with my family, that journey out of Mormonism, Mormonism began all those years ago. Well, at the time, I thought, this is my little story. I couldn't see the bigger narrative that God was writing. It was just my little story, but it was a good story he was writing. I was a sixth generation Mormon. I, as far back as I can remember, could not wait to get married in the Mormon temple. I dreamt about it all the time. Boys quickly became very significant to me and in my life and in my story. And I dreamt about that day that I would meet Mr. Perfect and he would take me to the temple where we would seal our marriage for time and all eternity. And it was 1978 and I put on my white baptismal gown, and my dad led me down into the baptismal waters, and I beamed as I looked out at my family. This day, I had been waiting for my whole life, all eight years of it. And my dad held up his hand and said what Mormon dads say, and then I remember working so hard to make sure every part of my body dunked under those cleansing waters, that all of me would be clean of the, all the little sins that I'd committed since I was born. And so the next day was a fast and testimony meeting, and I grabbed that microphone, and I stood tall, and I bore my testimony. I know the church is true. 
And I did. I believed it from my head down to my toes and everywhere in between. And I know Joseph Smith is a true prophet of God. And I beamed. And I was beginning my journey toward exaltation. This was that first little pebble I laid in that foundation for my eternal life in the celestial kingdom one day. And because I had a divine nature, I was confident I could make myself worthy of that. And at eight years old, paying a full tithe, there wasn't much to pay. Going to church every Sunday, obeying the word of wisdom, the standards were not that steep for an eight-year-old girl. So I was just confident, I can do this, and I'm going to do this. And then by the time I was 10 years old, I started to see that there's a shadow side to me, that I wasn't always worthy, and I was striving and striving and striving. All the time I was striving, and I wanted to be good, and I wanted to be worthy of Heavenly Father's love and acceptance and His blessings. And then I was, though, very aware that there were times where I was so unworthy. And so by the time I was, oh, 12 years old, I got to participate in my first temple ordinance. And so we went on a field trip, put on our Sunday best, went down to the temple, Salt Lake Temple, down into the bowels of the temple. And I got separated from the group and explored the first floor, and that was pretty cool. Somehow I escaped, I don't know how, and that was quite illegal. And then they found me and brought me down into the basement and that long trek, and I was so excited to do these baptisms for the dead. But this time I put on my white baptismal gown and I waited on the bench as all my little friends went and took their turn. And I took this man's hand and walked down into the font. And then, I don't know, for some reason all I thought is it's just gonna be like the day I got baptized. And so a man that I'm not that close to is now dunking me and he's talking so fast I can't understand him. I'm like, he must be talking another language. And it's like, and he kept dunking me and dunking me. It was almost like a waterboarding. And it went over and over. And I finally, I just kept my eyes closed and I just kept going back and back and back. And I was really proud that I was giving somebody the opportunity to enter into this whole plan of exaltation, this great plan of happiness. Like that was pretty incredible that a 12 year old girl had the ability to enable people in the afterlife to make that choice to get baptized into Mormonism. But at the same time, it was a little disconcerting, the whole process, but this was my normal and this is what we did and this was significant. And so I believed it all still from my head to my toes. And when I got to be a teenager, what felt like skipping stones into that foundation of my eternal destiny felt more like dragging boulders. The, the weight of it and personal righteousness and worthiness. And I just found myself feeling more and more unworthy, yet still striving. And then I got to my senior year of high school and dragging those boulders, we take on our God's accent. The God that we worship gets into us, and his accent gets into us. And so you can't worship a God of conditions and not create a culture that's conditional. And so I think as loving as my parents were and are, it's just, our, the accent of even our family culture was this uh, conditional acceptance and love. And um, we experienced a great deal of joy, but there was just everywhere I was, I was living in that tension on that pendulum. And so my senior year of high school, I was pretty much like a pressure cooker waiting to blow. And I would watch my friends drop like flies, freshman, sophomore, and junior years at East High School into the party scene. And I was digging deep and staying strong and resisting the temptation to break the word of wisdom. And, but I would see them the, that night of inebriation and think they're free from the shame. Like for a night, they're free from the legalism. 
And there was something so attractive about that freedom. And when I was on this pendulum of what I now know to be legalism, where I need to do something to gain God's approval and acceptance, the only place I knew to find freedom was at the opposite end of that spectrum, into licentiousness. And so right before my sophomore year of high school, I began to beer bong with the same passion that I'd lived Mormonism. And I just swung into this licentious world of rebellion. And it did bring me the freedom from the shame. And I shut down my conscience one party at a time, one night at a time, and I was free. And I didn't care anymore. It's like that's all I could do to survive that culture at that time. And so during that time, I was supposed to play tennis for BYU and did not want to go submit myself to BYU standards. And so at the last minute, I ended up at the University of Utah. And now my partying was devastating for my family, very devastating. And uh, for my parents, I had siblings who were also, I'm not going to talk about my siblings, but I stayed in camaraderie with my siblings, but it was very devastating for my parents. And so they were working really hard to figure out how to navigate these waters, I think, of shame for them. And um, so I get to the University of Utah, and I'm still doing my party thing, but I still believed it from my head to my toes. And I knew I'm just going to clean up my act in a couple years when I feel like it and go get a temple marriage. And that's what all my friends were doing. And I wasn't yet ready, though, to go co confess my long list of sins to my bishop because I wasn't ready to stop doing all of them. So just content to live in my unworthiness and not feeling shame about it anymore, though. And so I'm at the University of Utah, and this guy, or my a friend on the tennis team says, I got to line you up with this guy named Gary. You guys are going to click. You're exactly like two peas in a pod. And I was like, bring it. And guys were my god. Tennis, academics, and guys. And those were my places where I had looked to for security and satisfaction and peace and comfort and all of the good idols. And so. Gary and I got lined up and we clicked. And so Gary and I, on our second date, he started initiating a conversation about where we came from, what our beliefs were. And I, it's 1988 at the University of Utah, and I'm like, no internet, totally sheltered. I had a friend who was Jewish, and I had a friend who was Lutheran who never went to church. And then it was like, everybody was no Mormon, Jack Mormon, or non-Mormon, and so, Gary's, I'm telling him I'm a Mormon, and he knew what a Mormon was, and then he tells me he's a born-again Christian, and I'm like, a what? I've never heard of one of those in my life. What is that? And he's talking, and it's like a foreign language to me, and so Gary and I just continued to have fun together, and I'm like, I don't want to talk about, let's just play, let's just party and have fun. So for a month, that worked. And then it was November, or it was December, it was the f end of the f uh, quarter of my freshman, my first semester, my first quarter at the University of Utah. And Gary and I were driving around picking up report cards. It was snowing, winter was on us. And I put my hand on the door handle to get out of that car. And he said, Lisa, how do you know the church is true? And it's like his words floated across the space between us. And I, nobody had ever asked me that in my life. And I whipped my head around and I said, because I've had a burning in the bosom to confirm that it's true. And he said, how would you entrust your whole eternal destiny to an emotional experience, to a physical burning? And I was like, because that's how you know what's true. I have no, like, I had no paradigm for any other way of knowing truth. And so he then asked me, how do you know Joseph Smith is a true prophet of God? Because I've had a burning in the bosom, I know. Lisa, how do you know the Bible, or how do you know the Book of Mormon is an authentic historical work? And he went on with icities and authenticities and osities, and I, went from total confidence 
and my way of knowing truth to realizing I don't have a clue how to answer any of these questions. Nothing I can say will satisfy these. I don't know what I believe. I know the plan of salvation backwards and forwards, upside and down, but I can't answer these questions. And so my firm foundation, whatever works I had put into that foundation, felt like it turned to quicksand and I was in a free fall. So I told Gary, I don't want to talk about this. And so for the next month, he honored that. And then he came back from Christmas break and he's like, Lise, <clears throat> you're talking about your whole eternal destiny. And I went through this thought over Christmas break, what if it's not true? I could just become agnostic. And it's just like the knee jerk response. It's like nothing else could be true. But then I'm like, no, if it, I, need, I can defend this. If I just do the research, if I just start reading, I know that it'll be true. And so Gary and I started doing Bible study together because I believed it as far as it was translated correctly. And I was a Mormon, so I was pretty confident in my abilities, even though I'd never read the Bible really, to tra make sure it was translated correctly. And Gary, um, he believed it to be the infallible word of God. And so G Gary set out, or I set out to convert Gary, and Gary set out to introduce me to a Jesus he believed I'd never met. And so Friday and Saturday nights, we would party, and Sunday we would have Bible study. <laughs> and we did that rhythm all through that spring. And the first Bible study, we open, Gary opens the Bible, and he brings out a Bible study about relationships, and the first Bible study introduces me to this biblical God. And I thought everybody believed, I don't know why, I was just uneducated. I thought everybody believed God was once a man who progressed into Godhood. <clears throat> so Gary's talking about this one God in three persons, Jesus is God, Heavenly Father is God, the Spirit is God, and I'm like, wow, I was freaking out. And I was just enraged at him. I'm like, that's not true, that's not true. And he's like, Lisa, right here, it says, God is spirit. John 4, 24, I'm like, no, I can't say that. Well, the Joseph Smith translation says something else about John 4, 24. And so it just created this complete cataclysmic chaos in my soul, that first Bible study. And I was defending the Mormon God, tooth and nail, and I still believed it with all my heart. And so we went through that first study, and I think what it just started to stir in me is rage and anger. I am going to prove this Bible wrong. And the second study talked about the nature of people. And I'm just thinking the Bible talks about how we all have a divine nature. And Gary takes me into the Bible and for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God, period. And getting one after the ver one verse after the next after the next, where suddenly he's telling me, the Bible says you have a sinful nature, Lisa. And I was like, <sighs> literally something jumped out of me. I was so enraged. I do not have a sinful nature. Ironically, there was nothing in my life that would prove that. <laughs> Everything in the way I was living was, yes, we have a sinful nature, <laughs> but something in me was so opposed to that and so angry. And Gary just stood his ground very lovingly and stayed in there with these conversations. And if Gary wasn't my God and wasn't beautiful, I would have been out of there at Bible study number one. But the way God wooed me, he just gave, fed right into my addictions, basically. And so for five months, Gary and I went through all these major doctrines, the nature of God, the nature of people, what's heaven, what's the afterlife, how do we get there, the biblical plan of salvation, and I just harped on the Mormon plan of salvation, but at the same time, I was reading books like Josh McDowell's Evidence That Demands a Verdict, and More Than a Carpenter, and some other books to prove. I just had to wrestle through, what is this Bible, and what does it mean as far as it is translated correctly, like so many of you have talked about. And after five months, I started to realize the Bible is the Word of God, period. 
and there's all the evidence to prove it, and all the historicity, and at that point, I could start to accept, yeah, I have a sinful nature, and I need a savior, and I can't. A temple marriage is not gonna grant me eternal life. Like, I have no capacity to make myself worthy. And then I could start to play with the idea that there's one God, but, like was mentioned here earlier, the Trinity was described to me as an egg. So, like a shell, a white, and a yolk. Okay, that's heretical, by the way, so don't use that with anybody. And humidity, ice, and water. And I just sit there, and I'm like, that's your God? And so that was a hard one for me. But over the next four months, I just continued to wrestle, and I went and visited Sandra Tanner. And she was like my one source, and I would sneak in. I just felt like it was cloak and dagger. No, I just, nobody can see me. I can't get caught. And... Um, so over that next four months, I started to accept these major doctrines about who I am, that I need Jesus, that I can't do anything to make myself worthy. And Gary went away for the summer to play baseball. And at the end of the summer, right before my sophomore year, somebody gave me a book called Beyond Mormonism. And it's written by a man who... As I read his journey, I was still living at home because we lived blocks from the university. And I locked myself in my room, and there were books under my mattresses, and Journal of Discourses, and Bruce R. McConkie's Mormon Doctrine, and everything I'd been reading and scouring. And I read this book in one day, and it's like he was just putting words to my whole journey and my whole wrestle. And he was a professor at Rick's College who ended up coming to Christ, so he lost a lot when he came to Christ. And I read that book and I was like, God, I know I need Jesus. And I want him in my life. And I want to come into your kingdom. Like you're a good God and I want to be in your kingdom, but the costs are so great. And I don't know what an egg God is like. Like I can't, what's an egg God? And I can't wrap my mind around that. And I think that's part of the glory that we don't have a God that we can wrap our minds around. And so God came to me like he had been, just pursuing and pursuing, and he pulled back, gave me a portal into another reality, and I had a vision of Jesus on the throne, and I had not read Revelation 4 at this point. Jesus on the throne and a sea of people bowing down saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come over and over and over, and I fell on the floor. I was like, wash me. You're holy, I can't figure you out, but you're holy and I am not, and yet in your holiness, you draw so near. And I walked into his kingdom. Well, Gary started taking me to church with him at a little Bible church, and I just felt like I was in someone else's skin, like putting on someone else's oversized clothing when I'd go in there. It was so awkward. It was so uncomfortable. Pe women were in tank tops, and you know, the, you know the story. And everything was so uncomfortable. But I wanted to be with this God, and so, the other thing that was really significant about this next 14 months after I trusted Christ is there were very ingrained habits in my life and, uh, that had become addictions, and alcohol was one. And I, I wanted to stop partying. I knew the verse, do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And I wanted God's life to invade me, but there was this tension in me and this powerlessness to stop. And so Gary and I would still go out Friday, Saturday night, get drunk. And, and the unique part of this next season is that the morning after, I was very aware Jesus is still with me. And there's no judgment, there's no condemnation, there's always invitation. And he just encased me in his unconditional love and acceptance. 
and there was brokenness over my sin. There was brokenness over my inability to stop. But there was so much grace, and he was with me at the bar. I knew it, and that was what was so different from anything I'd ever known. Like, he made me worthy, and it didn't change. About nine months later, Gary took me to, it was the end of my sophomore year, a Campus Crusade for Christ meeting at the University of Utah. And I was like, what's happening? People are standing on chairs, raising their hands, singing, 100 students. And I didn't know people did that kind of thing anywhere. And they, he introduced me to the staff team, and they were like, here's a Mormon who became a Christian. Let's follow her up. Let's get her grounded in who she is in Christ. And so I was getting to a point where I was really hungry to start walking with this Jesus, to follow in his footsteps, to start to learn his ways of living, and went through these five basic follow-ups, and then it was summer, and Gary and I decided we were going to um, close out our relationship, and I was like, I'm going to walk with Jesus. It is time. I'm going to do it now. I want this, and I started dating this football player who didn't know the Lord and didn't want anything to do with God. And so again, it was just one more addictive behavior, looking for life in guys. And I'd been bred to do that, and I was really skilled at it. So Dave and I dated for the next five months, and I didn't go to crew meetings that next fall. I still hadn't told my family I'm a Christian. And my junior year, Campus Crusade is chasing me around campus. <laughs> Lisa Alexander's chasing me so faithfully. And so, like, she would catch me every couple weeks. We would meet, and she would just keep trying to get me into the Bible, get me into the Word. And so there was just this faithful, through people, God chasing me and chasing me. And um, Lisa and I were meeting. She caught me one time, and it was about November of my junior year. And she sat there with me and she said, Lisa, I think you should consider telling your family you're a Christian. And I just felt like she punched me in the gut. I was like, I shelved that, Lisa. Like, that's buried so far back there. We don't need to access that. And she just kept talking to me about it. And she said, here's the name of our campus director, Dennis Brockman. I don't know what a campus director is. I hadn't gone to, I'd gone to meetings like twice. So she said, call him. He offered to just walk you through, help give you some wisdom. And so I called Dennis Brockman, not knowing who this man is, and talked to him a bit. And I'm still partying on the weekends. I am not surrendered fully to Jesus. And um, Dennis, after 45 minutes on the phone, I have a total crush on Dennis Brockman. I'm like, well, I need to go to a weekly meeting and see Dennis Brockman. <laughs> so I made pumpkin bread. I like did it up. I go sit on the front row <laughs> unashamedly. And Dennis is older than I am. And he's like beautiful and he's going bald. And I'm like, I think a bald man is beautiful. This is from God. Okay, so that was the depth of my thinking at 21 years old. Yes, I confess, it was quite shallow. But I just love how God meets us. He just meets us. And so Dennis proceeded to just have some conversations with me. And then at the same time, God's just like wooing me with his mad love. And on my 21st birthday, which was December 20th, so I'd only gone to crew a couple times that year, um, I was determined I'm not going to go out. I am not going to party tonight. I am not going to do this. And then my girlfriends came over at 9.30, and I did it. And I went downtown Salt Lake to a bar, and I had probably eight shots, and, or six shots and eight beers, and I did not get a buzz. So I had to be present all night long. And the emptiness that I encountered in that space was haunting. So gross guys are picking me, picking up on me. I'm holding my girlfriend's head over a urine-soaked toilet. And there was total emptiness in that space. And I came home, and I just fell down on my bed. And I started with 
th uh, clenched fist, and I was like, God, you've got to take away my desire for alcohol, for guys. I just went down my list of addictions, take, like, clean my mind. And I fell asleep, and I woke up the next morning, and it's like he'd done a heart transplant. Like, my addictions were gone, and I knew it. I was free. And I was like, I got to go be with people who know this God. And the only place I knew was Campus Crusade. And so they were having a Christmas conference up in Oregon six days later. So I tell my parents, I'm going to this interdenominational conference. Like, that would be OK. Not back in the 80s, it wasn't. <laughs> I'm going to this interdenominational uh, conference, but there's, this, there's a bus going from BYU. There were like three students in a van going from BYU. And so I had to get that in there though. Like, shh, it's okay. And they were, what's going on? Who has authority to speak to you there? And they started to wig out. And the part that grieves me about my journey is that I couldn't bring them into my journey. And so this very much was flung on them. And like God gave me the heart to see this is, going to be brutal for them, as brutal it is as it is for me. And so I hop on the bus and I drive with all these students and they just embrace me like I was their family and get up to that conference. And Dr. Bill Bright is one of our speakers and he's the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, which is now crew. And he comes up and he come help change the world. And he gave this invitation and I was like, something in me was so moved. I knew this is what I want to do the rest of my life. I want to tell people about this God who breaks you free, breaks the chains, like every single one of them. And then I thought, crud, I got to go home and tell my family I'm a Christian. And my dad, got in touch with me, got through the hotel, he called and people came and found me because there were no cell phones back then. And I just remember being in the hallway of the Red Lion Hotel talking to my dad. And he's like, who has authority to teach you there? Nobody there has authority to teach you. Just doing what he knows to do and fighting for me the best way he knows how. And I was terrified. And I just thought, I'm going to go home and someone's going to confront me and that'll be a relief. Just confront me. Let's just get this over with. Well, no one would confront me. I like had this three foot or three story fuchsia elephant. And I'm like, somebody talk about it. Nobody would talk about it. And I didn't really want to talk about it. So three weeks went by probably. And then I made an appointment with my parents and I thought, how can I contain this conversation? Because if I'm at their home, we know it's just going to go crazy. And so Kyoto restaurant, like Asian, they're quieter, <laughs> very stereotypical, small. So I'm just thinking through the details of how can I orchestrate this and manage this conversation, which I think is really hard for my parents, <laughs> but I was like in total survival. So we go to the Kyoto restaurant and I shared with you before, shooting the breeze, and then mom and dad, I've placed my trust in Jesus Christ alone for eternal life. And my mom screamed, you've left us, you've left the family. And my dad started talking about doctrine and scriptures, and I don't remember leaving the restaurant that day. That began about an 18 month journey that was extremely tumultuous. And I was Jesus, 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 Jesus. Like everything was all about Jesus all the time. And I read the book of Galatians for breakfast every day. I could not leave the house unless I'd read all six chapters of Galatians because I needed that food to wash through and keep me just immersed in this good doctrine of this good God who he finished the work. And I remember showing up my senior year 
in my communications class, and it was a 7.50 a.m. class, and everybody's dragging their wagons in there, and I'm just, do, 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 Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I mean, I'm not talking about him all the time, but a lot. Anyway, this girl turns around who always sat in front of me. She said, what do you eat for breakfast? And I said, Jesus. And it was, it was like a knee jerk. I didn't have to think about it because I did. Like he was my food and crew was my family. When my family struggled to be my family and my mom became very mentally challenged as a result of my leaving the church. And And we did crazy things. Like I went on a, I went to a meeting with the pastor of Gary's church and the director of the student, what is it called? At the University of Utah, the Mormon Seminary. I just, the Institute. The head of the Institute at the University of Utah, a man who's like an, a post-Mormon apologist who is not gentle and me. So I'm with all these men going in, we're trying to create a bridge. And I sit, or we were standing there and the director of the institute says, hey, let's open in prayer. And the non-gentle apologist says, well, that's a great idea, but we need to pray because we believe you pray to Satan. I was like, like, I just wanna hide. There were just a lot of really awful things that happened in that time. Um, But one very significant conversation I had was with um, a psychotherapist that was helping treat my mom. And um, he needed to see me, He he was LDS, so that he could treat my mom more effectively. And so I went in and I shared my story with him at his beckoning, and he said, Lisa, nobody was created to go through what you've been through with your parents the last five months, and you're like one of the most psychologically healthy people that's been in my office. And I'm like, Jesus, 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 and all these Jesus, and he said, let's work on forgiveness. And so I said, well, I have forgiven them. And he said, okay, well, let's explore that. And You know, as a Mormon, I didn't really have a concept of true forgiveness. And so I just sat there and talked to him for about five more minutes. He's like, well, you have forgiven them. And he thanked me for coming in. And and then about 14 months later, Dennis, my husband, Dennis Brockman, who was my campus director and my Sunday school teacher, and I married, We were moving to Orlando, and my mom wanted to drive with me to Lake Powell. We were going on a family vacation before we before we moved, and I was like, oh, like seven, eight hours alone. This is going to be intense. (laughs) And um, she was so. They were just so traumatized. It's like my greatest, deepest joy was their deepest terror, and their deepest undoing and and desolation. And so. Um, But they worked so hard to stay in there, and that's what I love about them, and they've still worked so hard to stay in there uh, with me, and they have done a beautiful job with that. So we're driving to Lake Powell, and she said, Lisa, I've been wanting to share with you what happened with Dr. So-and-so after you met with him, and she said, "Um, he told us that it's like you're walking a tightrope, and we're down there trying to yank you off, and he said, You know, in all my years of practice, I've never met somebody so committed to her family and so committed to Jesus Christ. And you just need to let her walk the tightrope and let her go. And I was like, whoa. Like a Mormon therapist gave my parents that advice. And I'm not saying that to puff myself up. I'm saying that because it's like the love of God transforms us in a way that's so unexplainable. So as I began my second half of life in Christ, it's been the unraveling from my soul of the great plan of happiness, of the linear theology 
If I do A and B, God's going to do C, and he's supposed to, and he better. And it's the pursuit of the good life and happiness over the pursuit of the better hope. And so that began, Dennis and I married, he was the man of my dreams, he was, I was a bit idealistic, I'd been set up for that, so poor Dennis. And we, I'm just thinking, yeah, we have to raise our own funding, no big deal. God will just provide for us. And that began a 10 year journey of us struggling financially with our support development. And I didn't have a category for why God wouldn't provide for us in our work. And so I began think, I'm doing A and B, God. Like, I'm having my time with you. I'm doing my quiet times. I'm serving you. I'm walking with you. You're not coming through. And so I cried out to God, like for the first three years. I cry out to Dennis, let's do something different. I was like, ah, something has to change this. I'm not having the good life that I was designed for. And so the great plan of happiness was in me still, this pursuit of the good life. And probably the next season, the next three or four years, I just became more frustrated and more angry. And it's almost like my posture was, I love you, God. And in so many areas you come through for me, but this one area, like this shaking my fist at God. I'm, I'm still entitled. I wouldn't have said that. I didn't know that. But there was an entitlement. There was a demand that you have to do C because I've done A and B, this prosperity theology. And so then about the last three years, I just became apathetic toward God. And so I'm in a Bible study about 10 years into marriage and been through this long journey and there was a lot of goodness and we'd had some kids by this point, but there was this root in me that I had no idea was present. And so we're talking about relationships, not on the topic of this at all. And suddenly God just shows me this idol of financial security. And it was, I mean, it unraveled me. And I just start weeping and they're like, what's wrong, what's wrong? We did, like, she asked a question about something very lighthearted. I'm like, oh my gosh, this root of financial security, this idol is so deep in me and it's very generational. I had no idea and it created this posture of demand and anger toward God that I think this prosperity idea that God's supposed to just meet all my needs and do what I want, I'm being faithful, um, float out of that. And so I just had this picture, I just gave it to God and slammed it to the ground. And from that day forward, my prayer life shifted from every day being about finances to suddenly it disappeared from my journals. And I, yet, I didn't yet have a vision for this um, with life with God all day long, every day. I had more compartmentalized him, like the Father's here, the Spirit's here in me, Jesus is here, and I get to interact with them individually. And I hadn't made that, con that Trinitarian connection yet because I just hadn't had really good teaching yet about the Trinity. And so he wasn't an egg anymore, but they were just three people, you know, empowering me and I was relating to them like that. And then I ended up very spontaneously at Larry Crabb, he's a Christian psychologist who has a real passion for spiritual formation and just leading people in this journey of becoming little Christ's transformation. And so I ended up there very spontaneously in the six week period. And while I was there, Larry opens up and he starts talking about this Trinity and this picture that at the center of the universe is the Father, Son, and the Spirit pouring all they are into each other for the sake of the other. And then the father pouring all his love into the son for the sake of the son. And the son pouring back all that love into the father for the sake of the father. That it's completely other centered. And that the Holy Spirit is the love between the father and the son. That their love is so pure and so holy. It manifests in the third person of the Trinity. And I'm like, that is not an egg. Like, that's something that I could, I could get into this. And so 
as I'm hearing about this community of love that I was designed to be caught up in and that it's, that's eternal life, that's the gospel. It's not saved to heaven someday, but it's saved into this life with the Trinity. I realized I was overcome with my self-obsession for the first time in my life. I knew I was sinful and needed a savior earlier, but I never realized how much my love toward people was motivated by this pull beneath. And I think that was the other, like giving to just give without a connection to it. I was slain. And I had shown up at that school of spiritual direction feeling pretty good about myself. Like Larry started talking about sin and self-obsession. I'm like, ah. I kind of got that under control. And after he started sharing about the Trinity and how other-centered they are, and that they've designed us to pour all their love into us, to release us, to then pour it back to them and into the world, it changed everything for me. And so at that point, God was no longer these persons that I related to individually, but this Trinity whose dance of love I was created for, and that created this shift. I think that was the breaking of those final chains to that distant God. I experienced such intimacy, but this was a whole nother invitation. Well, that vision of the Trinity enabling me to see my self-obsession brought me to a place of brokenness over this pursuit of the good life that I never knew was even a thing in me. And so that great plan of happiness was being crucified to a desire to become holy, to be like Jesus. And then the other really significant awakening I had at the School of Spiritual Direction is this, the last day I was packing up, getting ready to leave. And one of my roommates who'd lived with me all week heard me on the telephone talking to a friend and we would process all day long at the school spiritual direction what God was doing in us. We were in triads. We were doing a lot of processing. We were processing at night in our house with all the people who were staying with us who were all in the school. So there was a lot of processing going on. Well, she came up to me after I hung up the phone and she said, Lisa, I think you're addicted to processing. And I said, she said, how does that impact you? And I said, I'll have to process that. <laughs> and that was such a wake up call. And as I began to um, sort through that and process that, what I realized is my processing was me going to the tree of knowledge all day long, every day, picking from that fruit, that original sin tree. If, if I can know, I grew up knowing when I'm in, when I'm out, what's right, what's wrong. And I was really skilled at eating from that tree of knowledge of good and evil. And I didn't realize how much that pervaded my soul still. And so I went home and I just began to lay down my processing and trust. And God thrust me, invited me into the mysteries of his love to walk with him. And it was a whole nother level of unraveling and, and, and resting and basking in the reality that he really is for me, that he is going to be my shield, he's behind me, and I can just rest in that. And so that was a long journey into embracing mystery, which I think is just a really critical step in the kingdom of God. Do you wanna put up that picture? Is it available? Okay, so here's my family today. And so while all this is going on, Dennis and I are having children, obviously. And eight years ago, seven years ago, we adopted Mez and Kamise from Ethiopia. And for years, like when I was 18, God, I would say it was God. I had a desire grow in me to adopt a black child someday. I didn't know the Lord at the time. I was 
you know where I was, I told you. So anyway, that was always back there. But then I started homeschooling my kids, and that was like unraveling. Um, I'm not a gifted homeschooler in my mind. People would always say, oh, you're so patient. I'm like, no. I ask forgiveness all day long. And homeschooling was the training ground for us living the gospel with each other. Brokenness, repentance, confession, and release of who we are, who we were designed to be, a deeper release. And so we did that all day long every day. And I felt like I had 10 kids instead of three. And this journey through homeschooling, what it did was expose how hard I was still striving to be good. And so I had been walking with the biblical Jesus for, oh, how many years? A long time, 12 years before I started homeschooling probably. And still, I was striving and striving. I need to be good. I need to be better. I'm not a good mom. I'm doing it wrong. And this bashing myself and bashing myself. And it took me so long to enter into the riches of his grace to unravel my soul, for him to just unwind me from the shame. And so this long journey of homeschooling was such a beautiful journey out of that, very painful. But during that time, I was like, no, we're not even thinking about adoption. And then God started to prick us. And our oldest was a freshman in high school. And so then Cole and Keegan, we were thinking, well, we'll ignore this most of the time. And then, like once a year, we would get pricked, and then we'd talk about it for one second. And we knew we didn't want babies again, and so we had a, like Cole is three years younger than the other two, and so we decided, well, if we did adopt, we want a child that could connect with Cole. So anyway, Finally, our pastor calls us to this 40-day fast of something. And those are scary people, just so you know, beware. Um, and so as, as Dennis and I were both reading the Bible individually during our 40-day fast, we, um, what God started to bring out of the Bible in flashing red lights for my husband was care for orphans, widows, and the oppressed over and over, flashing red lights. Dennis listens to the Bible every month, the whole Bible, high speed. It's crazy. So anyway, he's hearing this a lot, care for orphans, widows, and the oppressed. And then First John, if you have love and you don't offer it to someone in need, then you made love disappear, essentially. So he has this journey going on, and I am in, I'm reading through doggone Leviticus, and it's taken me forever because I didn't like it that time around. And um, I finally get through Leviticus, I'm driving home from the gym one day, and Moses dies. And I'd been with Moses in Leviticus for like three months, and I pulled over into the grocery store parking lot, and I'm like, oh, Moses. <laughs> I was laughing, but I'm like, I've been with you through all this turmoil. Like, you died. And so I'm just having this conversation with Moses and laughing, but I needed silence for a moment for Moses. So sitting there and then the Bible, I'm listening to it. And so I turn it back on, get ready to go. And Joshua is bringing the Israelites into the promised land. And as he does that, I was listening to the New Living Translation. And so they come into the promised land and I'm like, do, do, do. Yeah, yeah, I know this story. And then when they get into the promised land, God says, you know, gather 12 stones, or I'm sure they were pretty big stones, and build a monument. And when your people ask you, what is it for your children, tell them it's when the ark stood in the riverbed. And I was, I pulled my car over again. I was expecting a shared glory. It's when I brought you across the river, across the Jordan. There would be this I in you. There was no I in you. And I just started weeping. I was like, God, you contained yourself in this ark, the God of the universe, because your people needed you like that. And it's you who, you did it. You stood in the riverbed. There's no shared glory. And what I just heard him whisper was, Lisa, I want your life to be marked by a life that only I could pull off. 
Your personality can't pull it off. There's nothing you can do to pull this off. And I was like, I want that kind of life. I do, it terrifies me, but I want that kind of life. So I went home and Dennis and I had a conversation and we shared our stories and what God was working up in each of us. And, and God was kindly working his work in each of us simultaneously because neither one of us would have entered into this help in a healthy way had that not happened. And so we're sharing our stories. Well, then Dennis uh, comes to me in the kitchen one day and he says, Lisa, I'm 50, you're 40, you have fibromyalgia, adrenal fatigue, you can barely make it past 1 p.m., you're homeschooling, you're totally taxed, you're a great mom, but God's giving you lots of other gifts. I just see you as more than just, a, just being a mom the rest of your life. And if we adopted, it would just tie you down longer. And I just want to drive a nice car someday. <laughs> He's like, I, like we have hand-me-down cars and they're dented and ministry partners give them to us and it's wonderful. But he's like, I just really want to drive a nice car. I'm like, yeah, everything you're saying is true. I'm all that, and, and he's like, I'm 50 years old. I said, yeah, you are. Well, what I didn't know is in spite of all that God had been doing, Dennis that day just shut the door. Oh, God's not calling us to this. Look at all the circumstances. So I said, well, I'll consider everything you've said because it's all true. You want to drive a nice car? And so anyway, about two weeks later, I didn't know Dennis had just went, we're not supposed to adopt. Two weeks later, uh, about, I am down with my parents at um, Palm Beach, and Dennis calls me. He's like, I'm sorry, I'm going to be running late getting down there. I had, I watched this movie about Africa last night, and I could not sleep. I was so wound up, and I said, well, did it make you want to adopt kids and rescue them from there? And he's like, Oh no, I didn't even think about that. I'm like, okay. And I really wasn't fishing. I was just curious. Like we just kept being curious about where we were at in this journey. And so Dennis comes down to Palm Beach and a couple days later he said, I was so curious about your question. Are you still thinking about adoption? And I said, yeah, I am. Like I can't shut the door. I have no energy to pursue it. And I don't, like it terrifies me, but I can't shut the door. And he said, well, I think we need to go see an agent. I was like, oh gosh, because I knew once we go see an agent, we're in. So anyway, we went and saw an agent. And Dennis, when we went and walked out, he said, all right, so what stirred in you? I'm like, you first. And he said, well, my question is no longer do we adopt, but how many do we bring home when we do? And I was like, Oh, you're the conservative one in this household. Like, I'm usually the one who does these big leaps. And so um, we went after that with all that we were, and we were just going to adopt one little boy. And the kids who are least adoptable have the darkest skin and are boys and are older. And so we, are, we found an agent who goes out into the bush on this uh, Sudan border and has kids with really dark skin. So we were just thinking, we'll adopt an older little boy for Cole to hang out with. There were no boys available when we were in this six week period. And I was at a conference, which was unusual. I was at a conference, a Dan Allender conference, and he's a Christian psychologist, and it was on sex and sexuality. And all of a sudden I hear, two will be okay in my head. And I'm like, oh, this is about sex and sexuality. This is not about adoption. Two will be okay. So then I went on the website and I saw Mez and Kamise and I just knew those are our girls. And 14 months, 16 months later, we brought home Mez and Kamise and our family came unhinged. And they were eight and 10, just months after we brought them home. And that's a whole nother book. Um, but what God has done through that adoption journey, so many things, but he has just invited me into a love that I never knew could come out of me, like a sacrificial love, because our daughters have um, a tough story with deep loss, 
And so it's affected their ability to bond with us. And it's like, it's not a love I would have ever chosen had it not been God saying, I want your life to be marked by just me. I'm the only one who could pull it off. And that's really what's happening with this. And so I just saw, I'm living this little story and I knew I'm in God's master narrative that it's not really little. Each one of of our lives is this glorious, splendid life, but I really am in my little homeschool hole for 13 years, and I'm in an adoption storm for a, a lot of years. It's been seven years, and it's definitely leveling out, and um, our girls are wonderful. But I just was in this cave of hiddenness, and six years, a year after we adopted our girls, when we were completely unhinged, I was asked to share my testimony really flippantly, seemingly by a pastor at our church. And we were having, we were, I was heading out to family camp hours later. And he's like, Lisa, I don't have a testimony for tomorrow morning. Let me just, I was just thinking, who would have a testimony ready to share and be willing to share it with all those people, would you? I was like, I'd love to, because our church doesn't do a lot of testimony. And so I show up and my pastor's wife sees me right beforehand and she introduces me to this man. And she's like, hey, this is Robert. I would love you guys to meet. I knew who he was. I knew nothing about him or what he did. I just knew this is a very influential man in our congregation. And so she says, Lisa grew up in a Mormon family in Utah. Well, that's not usually how people introduce me. And I was like, huh. And he said, I would love to hear your story, like with passion. And I was like, well, you will. I didn't say that. And so anyway, 15 minutes later, I'm up there and I'm sharing just a 15 minute story of my story. And after the, after the meeting, I'm outside and Robert approaches me and starts asking me some really unusual questions that people don't ask me after I share my story. And he said, like, what book would you put in the hands of a neighbor who has a Mormon who's in this place? And I was like, huh, I don't know why he's asking me these questions. And then several questions later, he said, Lisa, have you ever thought about writing your story? And I just felt like he punched me in the gut. No, maybe when my parents are gone. Not now, we just adopted, our lives are crazy, and I don't know why he's asking me these questions yet. And he said, Lisa, do you know what I do? And I said, no, why would I know what you do? And he, everybody knows what Robert Wolgamuth does. And that I learned later. And so he said, I'm a literary agent. And I said, well, what's that? And he's like, it's a realtor for writers. And I was like, oh. And he said, I think the way you tell your story is so loving and compassionate. I don't see it being told like that. He said, would you consider writing your story? I was like, oh, I don't know. So a week later, I sent him a writing sample. He's like, yeah, you can write, let's talk. So we had an appointment a week later with his partner, and it was one of the most life-giving hours of my life, where these men, he was speaking so much vision into me, and through him, Jesus invited me to write my story. Well, that terrified me. So that was five years ago. That that's, that six years ago, that process began, and it took me five years to finish that publisher's proposal. And I jumped ship about 18 times. This is gonna cost too much. Like, I've worked so hard. My family has worked so hard to maintain a good relationship. I mean, we were at the point, my dad would come to Orlando to visit, and he was in the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. And my, our, we have a beautiful choir at our church, and our choir director invited my dad to sing in our choir. And so for a season, my dad would come probably every three weeks, because he was working in New York at the time, and he would don that, that choir robe with the cross at his neck and sit in that choir and just pick up the music and start singing with our church choir. And my mom would come and she'd help me homeschool the kids and like relationship for them, family for them is so important that they've, we've just worked really hard to figure out how to bridge this big fat gulf. And 
I didn't want to upset that. And family was so important to me still and honoring them. And so anyway, but I knew Jesus was inviting me to a journey that he could only pull off once again. And so after jumping ship 18 times and God very, very audibly through people like supernaturally telling me, no, you need to keep writing your story. I did not think I'd get a publisher because I have no public platform. I don't want a public platform. I don't like any social media. It's so hard for me. And I just thought, I don't know, God, why you're doing this, but I'll craft this um, publisher's packet. So anyway, I finally finished that and it gets submitted two years, two Christmases ago to a bunch of publishers and I get an offer. And the first words on that, as I sat going through those five years of crafting that stinking publisher's proposal, which takes people like a year, um, I just kept hearing the Lord say, perfect timing, my timing is perfect, my timing is perfect. And I, I believed that. And the first words from Harvest House were perfect timing, exclamation point. And, um, I was terrified. This isn't, most people are excited when they get a publisher. I was like, oh Lord, I didn't think this would happen. Now I have to go back to the Kyoto restaurant. And that's what it felt like, but we were on FaceTime. And I'm just fumbling through words. Mom and Dad, I really place my trust in Jesus Christ alone for eternal life. And I told him what happened, and I just said, Jesus, God's given me invitations. He's opened doors over the last five years, and he's asked me to follow him and walk through. And I just keep walking through the next door. And here's where this last door has landed. And I shared with them about the book offer, and I just said, I'm going to do this. <sighs> this was not my dream for my life. And if God had told me 29 years ago, and guess what I have in store for you, I'd have been like, bye bye at least for a while. So anyway, um, I told him about the project and my dad said, honey, what's the rub in you right now? And I said, well, I love you so much. And this is such a tenuous line. I don't know how to walk this line well, but I love you and I don't want to dishonor you. And he said, honey, I know you love us and we love you and we know you won't dishonor us. I think that's what just 29 years of loving each other, like in that foundation has done for us. Cause it's really hard right now. I liked being the good daughter and I wasn't the good daughter when I left the church. I was the shame daughter and I brought shame, but I would worked my way. I would loved them and they loved me really well. And we'd worked through all the pain. And now I'm not the good daughter. I don't feel like the good daughter. And I don't feel like the good sister. And I liked being the good sister. And once again, God's inviting me to release my relationships to him. Because he gives us a family. The body of Christ. And to trust him with these relationships once again. And it's excruciating, but that's, that's what our God invites us to. And so from the great plan of happiness, which didn't have suffering, it didn't have a theology of suffering and detachment from our second loves so that we could attach to the lover of our soul who will bring us the deepest joy. God keeps inviting us to a bigger story, each one of us, where we have this bigger narrative for his glory alone and not for ours. So a week ago, my dad had asked for an autographed copy of my book. 
And I was at my, ho my parents' home for about four days with the book in my hand. I came for my dad's 80th birthday surprise party. So I came early, October, I, came, I flew in on October 1st, my release date. And I just was sitting on the book. I was just dreading, oh my gosh, dreading this moment. How do I give it to him? This is so awkward. And then the night before I was leaving to go stay at a friend's house for this week, I went in to the family room and I said, mom and dad, I have my book for you. I know this isn't the coffee table book you've been waiting for your whole life or ever. And this is so awkward. And I read him a blog post I wrote that I put on my website, lisabrockman.me, in case you're interested, uh, that talked about the day I finished writing my manuscript and how the last thing I wrote was my book dedication. And I wept as I read them, that blog post. And I said, so, I just want to read my dedication to you. To mom and dad. We have journeyed through deep waters together. I wouldn't have wanted to grow, weep, laugh, thrash, and play in the depths with anyone else. I love you.